Can you hear us now, Nicholas? Okay, go ahead. Then you can hear us. It's not the name. Yes. It's not mine. Just dis disconnect from the audience. Yes. That's that. Okay. Can you hear them? <laughs> okay. So starting from the top, how the structure of the review session today is we're going to give you some questions. We're going to outline how to solve the question. Maybe two, three minutes. We're going to give you 10 minutes to solve, and then we'll come back and show you the solution. So it's a really practice makes perfect situation. Once you start to do the problem, you're going to realize what you don't understand. And that's going to be a lot more effective than us just telling you how to do it. Because on the exam, you're not going to have any help, right? So you're given a Fourier transform of a signal x of n. Here's the Fourier transform. x of omega equals 1 over 1 minus 4e to the minus j omega squared. OK? So this is a Fourier transform properties question. So we're going to use the discrete Fourier transform properties. We find a new Fourier transform for these two separate uh, equations here. So here we're going to have x of 9 minus n plus 3. And here we're going to have 1 half n x of n. So to solve this problem, you're going to want to look at the properties table. And the reason we're using the properties table is that way we don't have to recalculate any Fourier transform. We already know the Fourier transform. So we're going to use these Fourier transform properties to find the new Fourier transform. So the first step is to look at this. Again. Look at this equation that you're given and to see which properties here are seen in the Fourier transform properties and then apply those properties to this. Okay, maybe that should be enough. So you have 10 minutes, do your best. If you have any questions, we'll be walking around to help you, okay? So look at the Fourier transform properties table and see what properties are found in each of these and then apply those properties to this x of omega. This is the Fourier transform. So you're gonna apply those properties to the Fourier transform. Any questions before we get started? And for the people for the people on Zoom, if you want to put your solutions in the chat, that's okay too. Or put them in the Discord and we can help you verify them. Or just feel free to unmute if you have any questions. Thank you. Let's set a time for it.
the two points. Right. Hey guys. Hey guys, this is a two, not a ten. Sorry. Throwing you guys through the loop. This is perfect exam training, guys. You're never gonna know what to expect on the exam. <laughs> never not gonna know what they expect in the presentations either. Okay, this is training. Thank you later. Smaller and then it's not multiplied by just yeah. 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 Yeah
Okay. and let's solve it. So first, let's look at the time shifting that's happening here. So we have x of n plus k giving us e to the power minus j omega k x of omega. And next we have time reversal. Minus n would give us k to the power j omega k x of minus omega, and then we have three. Three is transformed as in the properties in the pairs table you have x of n equal to one. And the transform for it is given as 2 pi delta omega. And when your x of n is equal to 3, you would just have 3 times 2 pi delta omega. That is 6 pi delta omega. You can't and see anything you're writing. Oh, well, what's up? It's training, guys. It's training. It's teacher and training. Your training. Oh, well, good. It's good training. Yes. So yes, this is from the pair stable, and these are the properties that we used. Yes. So we, when we have x of n equal to one, the transform pair is two pi delta of omega, and when we have x of n equal to three, we just multiply three. To the transformation that is 2 pi delta omega, and then we have 6 pi delta omega, and now we combine all of this to get our transformation. We have x of omega given as 1 by 1 minus e to the oh, 4 times e to the power minus i omega or j omega squared. And we have e to the power j omega k, and our k is 9. And this times 1 minus 4 e to the power minus j omega square plus 6 by delta omega, and this would give us e to the power. 9j omega by 1 minus 4 e to the power minus j omega square plus 6 by delta omega. Yes. Is it 9 or is it minus 9? Yes, that's correct. It's positive 9. Why is it positive nine? Because if we do like the time reversal, it's negative. So it's negative n plus nine. If you switch the negatives, it would be n minus nine. I think 
think the time reversal is being accounted for when we're changing the sign here. But the value of k is just going to be 9, same as this here. The properties table says n minus k. So it is n minus k, but after you do the time reversal, you have like the x. Right. So you're doing like. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's like you do oh, yeah. your shift it's, first. It's minus nine, you yes. use the hmm. minus, like it is minus nine for the time shift. When mm -hmm. you do the time reversal, it, um, from changing the mega into the negative omega, so the entire exponential is positive. Yeah. Yeah, and for the second one, we have half. have n x of n. <clears throat> and here are the properties that we would be using is amplitude. Oh, yeah. I just have another question on that last one. Would the mm -hmm. uh, time reversal property affect the omega in the denominator of that equation. In the denominator of that equation? Because it's originally oh, negative. Yes, it would. It would. And then when you do the time reversal, yeah. positive j omega in the denominator. Yeah, it would be. Because we have x of minus omega. I'm sorry I didn't account for that. Yeah, it is x of minus omega and not x of omega. We have amplitude scaling here, and then we have n times n times x of n, and this property is our frequency. Yeah, differentiation. Okay, so when we have n times x of n, our transform is going to be j d of x of omega by d omega. Yeah, the property might be slightly misprinted, but yes, it is d omega. And yeah, let's do it. Our X of omega is one by e to the power the one minus four minus j omega squared by d omega and by difference by differentiation we have minus eight times e to the power minus oh eight j. Let me scan J omega. Which omega by one minus four e to the power minus J omega square. Okay. Now we have a half from here. I'm just multiplying it the equation and then we have a j into minus 8j e to the power minus 2j omega by 1 minus 4 e to the power minus j omega square so this is 4j and j is going to become minus 1 making it positive so we have 4 e to the power minus 2j omega by one minus four e to the power minus j omega squared.
So when you're solving any question that is related to transformation or like using flip properties, first identify all the properties that are being used and then apply the time related properties first and then go for the amplitude related properties. Okay, just like how we do the signal transformation where we apply the time transformations first and then go for amplitude. Here go for time related properties first and then go for frequency or amplitude related next. Should the exponent on the denominator be a three or so the derivative of the original fraction oh, yeah. power of negative? Yeah, two it's going to be three. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Math is not. Can you zoom out a little bit? Any questions, guys? Or concerns? Or Right, so All right. Okay, so next we're going to jump into some sampling problems. Um, so we're going to do, we're going to review this homework, this homework problem, um, I believe it was homework seven. And we're going to go over this and give you another path at it and then and let you ask questions and then solve it. All right. So we're given that a signal X of T with the Fourier transform X of J omega undergoes impulse train sampling to generate X of, should be X of T as shown below. And we wanna find what the minimum sampling frequency we need to prevent aliasing. And then we want to design a low pass filter and figure out what frequency we need that low pass filter to be at. So we can recover the sample if it's sampled at 600 pi. All right, and our X of T is given a sign of 325 pi T divided by pi T times cosine of 200 pi T. So the basic way to approach this problem, the first thing we always want to do when we're given a problem, right, is figure out what do we want to find? So really this question is asking for two things. It's asking for the um, Nyquist rate so the minimum sampling frequency that aliasing does not occur. And it's asking for the frequency of low pass filter we can use to recover the signal when it's sampled at 600 pi. So the way we approach the first part is we need to find what our maximum frequency in the function is. So the way we do that is um, on the box. Sorry, I'm having a brain fart here. Fourier, yeah. So we're going to use the Fourier transform, and then we're going to find the maximum frequency based off of that. Um, so at what point in our Fourier transform does the value of that transform go to zero? Then, because in this instance we have two functions in the time domain being multiplied together, we need to know what do we do with those two distinct bandwidths? How do we compare them? And how do we figure out the bandwidth of our overall function? And then once we have that, our Nyquist rate is simply going to be twice that value, right? And then for part B, which is finding the low pass filter values, we're going to compare our sampling frequency to our Nyquist frequency. And the easiest way to do this is to create a plot 
in our sampling space where we have a copy of our bandwidth at each interval of our frequencies, um, our sampling frequency. So I want y'all to go ahead, give this a shot. Hopefully you feel relatively confident with this problem because you should have seen it before. Um, and we'll be wandering around to answer any questions. And if you're on Zoom, go ahead and drop any questions in the chat as well. You're trying to make the max frequency of the C and then you're trying to see the max yeah, frequency yeah. of the C. Yeah. Show me that function again. So it looks like over to find that. Yeah, it's on there. Just go to the PowerPoint. It's on the wall. Actually, you can't actually. Just put this place. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Do you think there's anything? Just like a step. You're doing all right.
I don't know. I haven't really like this. Um, so so it would be which is done for this. Um, a reason why her Duke like in that's a banger that's I have questions about this one. That's what I'm saying. Is that like what you think is a good piece of yeah, so I don't know. So, yeah, I think it's supposed to be like Okay, but I okay, so what is the step after you do for your transport? Do you remember? So, this was like the exact question in our homework so, yes. But I'm like, I don't want to look at my homework seven because I don't know that I really did it right. Okay, they didn't Right, that's the thing Yeah. 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 Uh, so we have okay. So I'm gonna just pause this stuff like this. You have an institution for institution 12. Yeah. And then I can just read the cool browse out I just, I was like, I don't know. And it's okay, that's right. Yeah. I know that. Oh, Okay, okay, so oh, that was a 10 though, because I was like, no, so it's, it's, it's not. How are you guys doing? Okay, okay. Oh, so it's intended that it's. Okay. Um,
one does yeah, not occur, right? But over here it's saying one does not occur. What's the difference when it comes to solving the problem? So here it's saying that 75 pi one does not occur. But this question is asking one does it not occur. So oh, it's it like the other one side. One? So no, no, there's no difference in solving. It's just like the, the answer becomes different. So when does aliasing occur would be like at which point it's twice the Nyquist frequency and then every time less than that. Because every time if you sample at the Nyquist or less, you'll alias. But here oh. it's asking what is it not occur. So if you sample at the Nyquist or more, then right. at the very like, like like the range. Okay. Do we want to jump into solving? Okay. Let's go ahead and do that then. All right. So for our minimum sampling frequency that aliasing does not occur, we want to find our Nyquist rate. So we should know that our Nyquist rate is going to be equal to twice our function's maximum frequency. So in order to find that, we need to find our function's maximum frequency. So we take our x of t, and we're going to go ahead and apply the Fourier transform to it, right? Or actually, first, let's go ahead and redefine our x of t. So Rewrite this uh, All right, so we have our x of t, and our x of t is really two functions that are multiplied together, right? So in order to find our maximum frequency of this overall function, we want to find the maximum frequency of each individual functions, and then apply the bandwidth rules to this. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to let our first function here, the sine function, be x1 of t. And we're going to let our cosine function be x2 of t. And we're going to go ahead and redefine our x of t as just x1 of t times x2 of t. Right? So we haven't really done anything. We've just cleaned it up a little bit and redefined it. Um, so now what we can do is when we take the Fourier transform of this, we're going to get x j omega. And then this is going to become a convolution. Sorry. What's the constant that should be in front? You know, one over two pi. One over two pi. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I don't remember if something. But all right. So we have a one over two pi, and then we have our functions convolved now, because we went from time domain to frequency domain, and our multiplication is going to become a convolution, right? So now we can consider these two functions independent. So let's start with our x1 of j omega. Okay. Let's start with our x1 of t. And that's going to be equal to our sine function up here. So we're going to have sine of 325 pi t over pi t. Now we can go ahead and we can do the Fourier transform of this function. We're going to get x1 of j omega is equal to, and we're going to have from our pairs table, we're going to have one for the absolute value of omega is less than our w value, and zero for our absolute value of omega is greater than our w value, where our w is equal to this coefficient on the t. So this is our w, right? So this is going to be 1 for anything, any frequency 
less than 325 pi. And it's going to be zero for any frequency greater than 325 pi. So does anybody want to tell me what is our maximum frequency for X1? Based off of this. Perfect. So we know that our, our X of J omega, X1 of J omega goes to zero for any value greater than 325 pi. So that's going to be our maximum frequency. Before that, it's going to be equal to one. We have a frequency component there. After 325 pi up to infinity, there's going to be nothing. So we can say that for x1 of j omega, our maximum frequency is going to be equal to 325 pi. Perfect. So we're halfway done. Now we have x2 of j, of j omega. So we have x2 of t, and that's going to be equal to our cosine of 200 pi t. So now apply the Fourier transform, and we get x2 of j omega is going to be equal to pi times delta omega minus 200 pi plus omega, uh, or, sorry, delta omega plus 200 pi. All right. So can anybody tell me what our maximum frequency for our x2 of g omega is going to be based off this? Rui? Yes, you said 200, right? Okay. Yes, so our maximum frequency for this function is going to be 200 pi. So in this case, for this function, if you visualize this graph in your head, all we have is two delta functions, right? We have a delta function at positive 200 pi and at negative 200 pi, and that's it. So we know after we hit those values up into infinity, there's going to be nothing. So that means it's going to be our maximum frequency. So for x2 of j omega, our maximum frequency is going to be equal to 200 pi. All right. Any questions on how we got those maximum frequencies? Yeah. Um, where did you guys get the property for the first maximum? For the sign? Um, it should be in the pairs table for the Fourier transform. Let me take a look. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's the same function. Oh. Make sure you're looking at the continuous one. Let's double check that. Okay. Are we good? Perfect. Any other questions? Okay. So now we have our maximum frequencies for x1 and our x2. So now we need to go back to our x of j omega. So we had that defined up above. Does our x1 convolve with our x2 of j omega? And this factor here is the state. Yeah. Sorry, where did the 1 over 2 pi come from again? Uh, it comes from the property table. So um, for the continuous time Fourier transform, when you move from multiplication in the time to convol uh, convolution frequency, I believe there should be a scaling factor of one over two pi. Does that line up with what the table says? I think so. I'm finding a okay. uh, multiplication. Yeah. Like it's not frequencies. That's for discrete time. It's discrete. Yeah. If you can the formula sheet from exam three, it's the second page. Oh. 
then it's under the competition property. They have to the most of the property. Yeah, you're still. Yeah. That's the convolution. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, so the multiplication property, because we're going from multiplication in the time domain, right? So that's what it's defining as multiplication. So that's what we had in our original problem, is we had two functions multiply the ending in the time domain. Uh, so we're going to use that multiplication property. So it has the one over two pi times that integral. That integral is just the definition of the convolution. It's just written out in long form. But it's the same as saying this function can bolt with this function, right? So, OK. Does that make sense? OK. Perfect. So in this particular instance, really all we're interested in is these um, maximum frequency values. So this scalar is going to be an amplitude scalar. So it's kind of irrelevant to us, right? So we can just ignore this and act like it's not there. So really, what this boils down to is we have function one can evolve to function two. And from our bandwidth properties, we know when we have multiplication in the time domain or convolution in the frequency domain, our maximum fre uh, frequencies should be added together. So we have our maximum frequency here of 325 pi and our maximum frequency here of 200 pi. So since we have a convolution of the frequency domain, we're just going to add these together. So for x of j omega, which is our overall function, our maximum frequency is going to be equal to 525 pi. All right. Now, we're, we got one more step to solve the first part of this problem. So if you remember, it's asking for the maximum sampling frequency, or the minimum, sorry, the minimum sampling frequency that aliasing does not occur. And that's our Nyquist rate. So what we found here is our Nyquist frequency, the maximum frequency of our function. Our Nyquist rate is a sampling rate, and it's equivalent to two times our maximum frequency. So in this particular instance, our Nyquist rate is going to be equal to two times our Nyquist frequency, which is going to be equal to 1050 pi, right? So this is the answer to this first part of our problem. What is the minimum sampling frequency in which aliasing does not occur? All right, any questions on that? Is the um, for homework seven going to be released? Yeah. Homework seven going to be released? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so that's the first part of our problem done. Now it asks us for what frequency of a low pass filter can X or T be recovered if the sampling frequency is 600 pi? So we have a sampling frequency. Of 600 pi. Immediately, alarm bells should be going off in your head with this, right? So we just calculated our Nyquist rate, which is the minimum frequency we need for aliasing to not occur. It would be 10, 1050 pi, right? 1050 pi. Now, all of a sudden, we're sampling at 600 pi, which means we're going to have aliasing 
because we're under our Nyquist rate, which means automatically that our original signal is not recoverable, right? So hopefully you should just be able to logic your way through that and take one look at this and go, oh, okay. There is no frequency of low pass filter where we can recover the original, um, the original sample, right? But if you're not quite there yet conceptually, another way you can approach this is with graphing. So based on our sampling frequency, and we know we're using impulse train sampling in this case. Um, let's see if I can pass P of T. Okay. So we're going to have our P of J omega. It's just going to be impulse function that are spaced by 605. And then we're going to have our x of j omega, where we're going to have frequencies from negative 10, 50 pi to 10, 50 pi. Right? Oh, sorry, actually. It's not going to be 1050. So remember, for this particular instance, we want to use our maximum frequency of our function, not our Nyquist rate, which is what I just almost did. So don't make that mistake. If you're going to draw these graphs out, remember, this is just of the function. So we want the maximum frequency of our function. So this is going to be 525 pi and negative 525 pi. All right. So now, when we do this sampling, what we're essentially doing is we're convolving these two functions, which means for R up here, once we have these convolved, we're going to have XP of T, which is our sampled signal, right? So let's examine what happens to xp of j omega. So what's going to happen is when we sample this signal, we're going to get a copy of it centered on each of these delta functions we have here, or impulse functions, right? So we're going to have one centered around zero. And then let's say this is 600 pi. We're going to have another centered around 600 pi. Then we're going to have another centered at 1200 pi. And if you notice, we have some overlapping regions here, which is how we define our alias. If we see those overlap regions, that means we're going to have aliasing. And I just drew this roughly. But if you wanted to find these values for these edges of this bandwidth, right, this would be equal to negative maximum frequency. This particular edge, which is associated with the one at 0, is your maximum frequency. And then this is going to be this left edge centered around 600 is going to be your sampling frequency minus your maximum frequency. And this leading edge center at 600 is going to be your sampling frequency plus your maximum frequency. And then this is going to be sampling frequency two times your sampling frequency minus your maximum frequency and two times your sampling frequency plus your maximum frequency. Does that all make sense? How you get that plot? how you get those values of those edges. All right. So if we sample at above our Nyquist rate, it's going to give us space between the edges of those boxes. And that's where we want our low pass filter to be. Because we want to get everything that's under that 
which is our copy, our original copy, but we don't want anything over. So we would want to have our low pass filter be somewhere in that space. In this case, there is no space, right? We have overlap, which means we have aliasing. So we're not going to be able to recover this. In this particular instance, and really with any of your, um, with any of these kind of sampling problems, the general formula to find your values of cutoff frequency is going to be your maximum frequency is less than your cutoff frequency, which is going to be less than your sampling frequency minus your maximum frequency, right? Because if we look at this plot, right now, this is overlap. But if it were not overlapped, if we were sampling above our knife was rate, these values for our maximum frequency and our sampling minus our maximum are going to correspond to these edges. So all we're saying is we want our cutoff frequency to be somewhere in between those two edges. So in this case, you're going to get 525 pi is less than your cutoff frequency, which is less than 600 minus 525 pi. So it should be 600 pi. All right. So this is going to give you 525 pi is less than your cutoff frequency, which is less than 75 pi. That doesn't make any sense, right? That inequality, there's no solution to it, right? Having a number be greater than 525 pi and less than 75 pi. So immediately we see, okay, this inequality has no solution, which means there are no cutoff frequencies to recover signal. Therefore, signal is unrecoverable. All right. Any questions on that section of the problem? Yeah. So then, for example, if the sampling frequency was, say, 4,000, yeah. you know, just a big number. Mm -hmm. um, so then you'd end up with like, 3,000 something on your right hand side of that equality. Yep. Then yep. would you want to pick any number in between there, or would you want to pick something kind of closer to your max frequency yeah. or closer to the sampling frequency? Yeah. So if you, uh, it kind of depends on what type of filter you're using. So if in ideal signals and systems world, you have an ideal filter where just anything past the cutoff frequency gets cut out. In that case, as long as you're in that range, it doesn't matter. But in the real world, your low pass filters, if this is your magnitude of H of J omega, are going to look something a bit like this, right? Where your cutoff frequency is around here. And you have a little bit of dip before your cutoff frequency, and then you have a bunch of like leftover stuff around your cutoff frequency before it really tapers off. In the real world, you would want to have it closer to your maximum frequency, but not on top of it, so that you're not getting impacted by this dip right before your cutoff frequency, but you're also giving it enough um, space with your between the, the start of your next copy, right? Because you also don't want this part. On the right side, if that's right on top of your next copy, you're going to have issues because some of that's going to bleed through, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Can I side of that? Yeah. So just to add on, add on to what Ryan said. That was a really good question, by the way. So in your example, you're describing something like this, where if this is one sample, the other sample is like all the way out here, right? There's this huge break here. And this is like at 4,000 something. 4,000 minus some again. So in the real world, like Ryan was saying, there's also, you know, if you were to take the additional you know, processing classes, you'll learn about things called like down, down sampling and resampling. So basically, if you were, if your maximum frequency, let's say is 200 hertz, and you're sampling at 4,000, you basically have all this wasted space. Because if you're sampling, it's not going to be nothing in here. You're going to be like recording like a bunch of zeros 
right, on your whatever device you're recording on. So it's basically like wasting a bunch of space. So in the real world, you actually want to like maximize this distance so that it's like these two peaks are as close to each other as possible, but not overlapping. So you don't alias. So you you want to like minimize this distance. So normally they call it like an engineering Nyquist where you'll still say about like 3.5 or five times your Nyquist rate. You don't ever want to do just two. You want to do like above that. So you make sure you get all the signal. And then once you have like, you know, on your code, you just downsample it. So you, you're like saving storage space. Uh, would you like to continue solving or do you want to break a quick break? Five minute break or keep going? Power through. Okay, all right. There we go. Building some mental endurance. No breaks allowed. That's the thing to do, guys. Final exam for this week. Breaks. Breaks on PTO. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, you got five minute break. Oh. <laughs> None of that. No breaks. Okay. Okay, so looking at Dr. Kodabakar's announcement, there will, there will very likely be Laplace. We obviously haven't seen the exam, but I think it would be good to do a Laplace example. So here is going to be a Laplace question, and we're going to try to find the impulse response of a causal system. And they give us this system here. So this is the, oh, this is my, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, pencil switcher. <laughs> so here's the system you're given in the time domain. And so it's asking for the impulse response. Does anybody know what the impulse response is? Even it's the Oreo shake. <laughs> I got impulse to buy it. Okay, not when you want an Oreo shake. There's, that's the second impulse response. What's the signal to the system impulse response? It's going to just be H of T, right? So this is going to be equal to X of T involved with Y of T, right? Which, well, it's not true. I'm going to give you guys wrong information. So then here, in the boss, I mean, it's going to be H of J omega. Which, when you have a system, right? Let's, let's call it X of T. H of T. And you have your alpha Y of T, right? You get this a million times. So Y of T is going to be equal to X of T involved with H of T. Which, after we do the Laplace transform, comes Y of J omega equals X of J omega times H of J omega. Okay, so then we just solve for obviously H of J. So we're going to be looking for this. So just to get a little, you know, refresher on how we find the impulse response, it's going to be something like this. Okay, so going back to the actual question, the first thing you're going to want to do is apply the Laplace transformation. Okay, so let's apply the Laplace, and you're going to get everything into the Laplace domain. And then you're going to want to solve, rearrange everything so you get it in this format. So after you do the Laplace, you want to rearrange everything so you get it into the y of j omega over x of j omega format. And whatever you have, so this should be the left side of your equation, the right side on one side of the equation, and the other side will be your h of j omega, right? Okay. So then, Let's also apply. Uh, I'm not sure if we need to do the. Yeah, let's do for practice. I think we get to do for practice. So let's do that. Then after this, we'll do the inverse of loss to get it back into the time domain. Okay. So by to do the inverse of loss, we're going to need to do partial fractions very lightly. We're going to have to simplify it in a way so that it's on our pairs table, and then. We're going to apply the actual inverse Laplace. And then in order to apply the inverse Laplace, going hand in hand with that is determining our region of convergence to know which property we have to do, right? Determine region of convergence. And I gave you a little, I don't want to spoil it, but I gave you a little hint on how to determine the region of convergence. And it's in the question. So be a little bit careful about that. So that's all I want to say. But Try to follow that. So basically, apply the Laplace and inverse Laplace to find h of t. So here's your equation. Goal, find h of t. Okay. Any questions on or concerns? 
or in on the previous problem, if you guys want to have burning questions before we start this one. Okay, let's get to work, guys. I better see you all working. Am I seeing any slaggers picking you up? Guys, I was testing you again. This is the we're in the clock domain, right? This is be yes. not okay. Wonderful. You guys are all passing my tests. You guys are such great students. I'm so I have so much promise for your teachers. Great. 
Um, no, I think everything's right. It's just you're going to transfer it into like the form still made. Uh, yeah. yeah. This is in lecture 12. Uh, did I miss the part where he tells us what X is the end part? We're supposed to figure that out because I think you're supposed to transform it and then rearrange it okay. to the flip sides, like what you want to solve for, and then you move it first. But we're supposed to do that. So, uh, I think I said on the bottom, but I'm not sure. So, it's like I rearranged everything now. I did the English speakers. You can do partial. Or maybe only if that's a good stretch. This and we should try to convert it into one of those forms. So we have the SDS alpha. Yeah, I I to I Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I don't know. I don't really have like 
set in stone plans today, but I was only planning to be here until like two or three weeks. Yeah, yeah. So much is two. Hey guys, so for the question, I'll just copy and paste it down here. There's a word in here that's kind of a hint as to what your region of convergence is. So I'll just tell you what that hint is. I'm basically telling you that it's a causal system. So knowing that it's a causal system, how do you identify the region of convergence? Causal system. Okay. Okay. Good over here. Any questions? Maybe another two minutes, guys. Yeah. Two minutes. Mm -hmm. It says so. I did the conversion, but I don't understand. So, I don't need to So, I did what you did. This is like every And then, so we get this This is the linearity one. Oh, you can do that. So, you can ask that. Yeah, you So, when you're talking about active reason of origin, I use your. Yeah. So, I'll just drop it here so I don't. I'll give you a chance to try the actual problem, but just in general. Let's say you have two arbitrary poles. You don't have two poles. Just one but let's just other. say you have two poles. Yeah, let's call this minus five. So there's two properties about systems that he's very likely to test, to test on. The first one is causal. Like you said, past and present. So yeah. when, when somebody says the system is causal, that means that the region of convergence so, like, is well, to the right of the region. I feel region. like you're missing some that's really important. And they're going to ask I don't you, have is, any... right? is the region of convergence to the left or to the right of your, of your pole? And that like, will be the wrong property. Any... And if you use the wrong property, it'll be the wrong answer. It, it kind of like, cool. for like the, no, the math, I guess. So causal is going to be to the right of the right of the pole. If we tell you that it's anti causal, let's, see. let's label this so we have a reference here. That's going to mean it's to the left of your left. Then you would use the opposite property. You'd use that it's to the left of minus a. And then, so like depending on what it is, you solve it. Is if we tell you that it's stable. Because you'll have like two poles. So stable means that it's like outside of the left or right pole. Now we're talking about as axis. So if we tell you that it's stable, that means that it's usually like a shot Whatever the poles are. That the ROC contains Remember when they, like, the circle and cross? The, it will contain. Oh, no, so no, but like, causal versus not causal. I think it has so to do with like if it's on by like on what causal. side of the axis, the right axis right it is, or the pole. It's called the left of your left. Yeah. And stable, it will contain. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, there could be yeah. 10 poles. You're, uh, but it'll contain by an axis and and with causality. So if you have a causal system, we'll use the property to time. Um, so the circle thing is for the Z transform. Okay. It's not for the so Laplace. Going to use so the Laplace, you have your real imaginary plot, if we tell and then you're going to have a bunch of vertical lines on this, this right? This minus poles. Here. Um, this, and for a causal system, so you would your region of convergence is going to be to the right of your four, rightmost pole. It would be S. So let's say we have a pole at negative right. two, and that we have a the, pole at four. The, the your region of convergence is going to be anything greater than four. Right. Yeah. And for anti so it's minus it's going to be so exact like, opposite. Say, it's to the left of your left. This would be four. So if we had the same poles, but now it's anti so it's going to be to the left of negative two. So um, let's look at here. So that's how you do your region of convergence. So here, and then you, for stability, which I so don't want to ask here, about, but if he does, so just, it's, it's if your imaginary so axis is included in your region of convergence. 
plotted. So if your imaginary um, axis so is in your region of convergence, yeah. it, it would be stable. And if it's not, it's no, unstable. No. You do want to do the inverse plus, but it's that makes sense. To plot it. Okay. okay. Plot it. So here, does that help? S plus five. What's yeah. going to make this? Okay. You know, minus five. Give it a go. So minus five. And then we can compare. So then the, we're going to think it's causal. So then this would that. be your ROC. <laughs> Would it be, sorry, this would be ROC, but this region is to the right of this, mm -hmm. which would make it, you want to use this property, um, that the region of convergence is greater than minus A. Okay. Minus A is minus 5, yeah. because yeah. A is 5. Uh, so, you me so far? So, yeah. if we're going to say, yeah. no, no, it's okay. Um, so, when you say it's causal, was that given, or how were you able to do that? Yeah, that was given in the question. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I actually didn't like show on the screen at the beginning, but. That's all right. Yeah, it's a causal okay. system. So, that, that would be given. And in the initial question from the homework, it actually wasn't given. I just added that for initiation. But if, if you're not given any information about that, what I would do is I would go with assume it's causal and write that you're assuming it's causal. I'm saying assuming it's causal, and that's why I determined the region of convergence to be this region. Because in real life, like all your, if you're reporting something, it's causal. So everything, all systems, the real world. Because otherwise you're like predicting computer values, which is okay. So let's just do one more practice, and then I'll leave you to do this. Okay. So let's assume that we're not talking about stable, and I, instead I wrote looking at the stable system, right? So then that becomes a little tricky, right? Because this is your ROC, okay, over here, and here are your two poles. So when you're solving this one. The one over this minus four, so you're going to want to use um, this quantity is less was, than minus a, right? Because I think it was this region, so it's, that. Yeah. But it's confusing because so. you're going to go to minus five. Yeah. This region is to the right of it, so here's the other property. Yeah. So the, the properties might change determining on what we tell you the ROC. Does that okay. make sense? Okay. I think just keep practicing and, and just remember. Getting to this stage, you're set up for success. Yeah. So, what's your other one? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I we can kind of try to think of it. So now it's going to be yeah, I can yeah. So now we are just going to oh, use it uh, uh, okay. yeah, it's not as common. Yeah. So, so this is a lot of wrong here. Oh, why? 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 And this is your x. So let's take y of s common. So we regular like is five is from here and five from here, <laughs> and then we have use the here in which that is and one. Uh, okay. Uh, so now we just like, so cross multiply box. things so to get y by s by x by s form, and now we have s plus one by s plus five. And then we do the yeah. S. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we're thinking it. I know. I was like, where are we getting equations to do partial fractions from? I don't get it. Yes. And in the transformation table, we do not have a transform for this particular type of thing. So we try to make it into an existing transformable. Part. So we just add four and subtract four in the numerator to make it equal to the denominator. Okay. So we're going to have s plus five by s plus five, and then we are left with minus four. This will give us five minus four by s plus five. This will just be one, right? So it is one minus four by s plus five. And this term is transformable, right? And in this, right? 
that's it. So we would just look at the chart and do whatever we can. So yeah, we can make it into a form that is transformable. Yeah, and it's all just manipulation and oh, yeah, it's not. So there's manipulated. no no specific real party to that. So yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, but it has to be correct. Like it has to make sense logically. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so apparently we're supposed to know yes, to do that. Yeah, depending on the question, but I get what she was trying to do. <laughs> I didn't find that she said. She said this didn't work because it's not like that. So she did. I think she's talking about the peers table. Oh, I got what she did. So she now she has S minus. So she used this one. Or. So this is what she did. So yeah, because now you can just take the four out. Exactly. So if you're not going to this is good. Oh, it's like So you swim it out like this guy. the depth of the So you can buy this. Come on, buy it all. This region Okay, so what do we do now? Kind of inverse? <laughs> yeah, so now you like inverse it. So we have, so we did the partial interaction and then we looked at the first table and then you apply, it says the phi inverse. Oh, okay. Um, okay, okay. Okay, so we have to apply the inverse. So we have inverse. I see. I think if he was here, yeah, that's not my opinion. I don't think I'm able to just put out to make it look like he was saying 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 he was
It's that deli yeah. on Scottsdale Road. So the one on the road. road. It's, it's like true. I don't know. See this place. Oh, yeah. See really? Yeah. Right. yeah. Awesome. And then from there, you can then pack your car. I see that's probably a lot more. But I like in the past situations, so they would call A over whatever S was. Something and then it would solve for A and then they would solve for B. How do you do that? Part? You multiply like um, the denominator of A to the like to B, like, and then opposite, and then you like use so like A and B are constants, and, back, and then you have like your factors. And then you make your two equation based off like the constants and. Then, from the variables yeah. and then you would just distribute yeah so then the a and the b and then separate you know then solve the like two the, yeah. the variables or whatever and then you get a and b but it gets more weird when you have like <laughs> squared <laughs> and then and then yeah. Yeah. the plot was wrong but how the plot was on the edge so, so we so we have okay so four. I thought it was um for the zeros and the ones. It has to be like what makes it zero. So I, I get like s plus five and then the pole would be negative five. But I don't understand why. So it's a that's not a big deal. Yeah. Is it? Are you sure? The whole hour to, out of your day just to get here. So Wilson, yeah. I'm probably right then. I was like, oh, uh, I'm gonna record it, so maybe I don't need to do it. But then I was like, it's the last exam. I haven't done like the grade calculator in my Excel sheet, so I don't actually really know. Well, I'm probably gonna pass, but like. I don't know if I have a borderline. I always end up with borderline grades. So, oh, so I don't know. Yeah, so well. so then I was trying to do the course evaluation for all the extra credits, and they were all closed. So I was like, hey, so did you do one? No, you didn't do one, but um, I only can did one. You did that because of me. I think you only need to do first questions if it's if it's like falling over. Because I never got a course evaluation thing in the email. Okay, that's what Will said. But four wouldn't be zero since the new one. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure and and then he me back and then he did extra credits into the yeah. yeah, so like I went to go do the course evaluation those and it's like the link he said so that they were all closed. Yeah, they were closed. Just no, what I haven't had yet. Um, I went to do them after the symposium thing and I couldn't. I think I had it. Oh, yeah. Like it's somewhere. Yeah. Like 11. I like the I really like the changes. Oh, my God. I got it. It's just always so crowded in there. We both disagree with what we did. So, in this case, four would be zero. It's so Gregor. Yeah, I walked in. Normally, yeah, he was like, oh, because I was waiting to sign in. So I thought we had to sign in. But in this case, there's no answer. And she was like, oh, you're not here for Dr. Steve. Still have to sign in. Am I good to do the problem? To solve the problem? Really, that's what we did. Is when the function is. I was like, oh, okay. And then he was like, Dr. Gregor was like, oh, do you want to do some So you have a like a one. Well, I got to do it for. If there was an S in here, a class, class, that's fine. He's like, I'll just do it. Okay. Okay. Just so he asked me to like evaluate this. One for S. Like, 
you get four. Four. Yeah. Well, it was like I mean, I'm already evaluating. So you're zero in this case is actually a negative the assignment. So like, yeah, if you want me to like <laughs> do my evaluation, like yeah. But I felt bad because one of the groups I talked to, like I actually like I talked to them, but then the other group they were explaining stuff to me, and I just got so bored. I was like. Are we ready to start? Yeah, I'll be doing this pretty crowd. Like, pretty much the kind guys. Okay, I'm gonna start. It would just be the main writer. Oh yeah, yeah. And that's what that's why normally you think of it as writers, but really you care about the function. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hold on. Let me. Okay. I just in the super chat. Anyone do my question? You can head in the chat. Well. This is solutions. Yeah, there's like a whole other four. No, if you tell somebody there's a whole other four, you want to back the problem. Like if there was a four, oh, uh, are there two? Yeah, okay, never mind. You're good. You're good. I'll talk to my friend. No, no, I think you're good. Okay, guys, are we all ready? Okay, let's get started. So, we just think Okay, okay, thank you. Here's our question, guys. We have to find H of T given this little class. Let's work through this. The first step is we're going to apply the Laplace transformation, right? So all the Y of T's become Y of S. So it goes from a lowercase Y to an uppercase Y. It's not very good handwriting, but and the T's go to S. And for example, X of T would go to an uppercase X. And then S. So that helps us for these five Y of T. And then for this dy dt, we're going to apply the property of we're basically going to add an S for each term of the derivation. So this guy would become S Y of S. So for example, just to show you an example, if it was d squared Y of T dt. This would become S squared Y of S. But that's not the case here, just for an example. So then we're going to have plus five y of s is equal to s x of s. Remember, this x came because there's the first derivative here. And then plus x of s. So now the goal is to get it into the y of s over x of s format, right? So to do that, let's factor everything. So we're going to have y of s on the outside plus f plus five is equal to x of s is equal to x of s, s plus one. So all I did here, guys, was I factored out these y of s's. That comes out here, and I factored out the x of s here. So now we can divide each side by x of s. This becomes s plus five equals s plus one. So this guy cancels out, right? And now let's divide both sides by s plus 5. So y of s over x of s equals s plus 1 over s plus 5. OK, great. So here's our h of s. So now we want to get it into h of t, right? So we have to apply the Laplace transformation. So once you get to this step, your first, your first thing in your mind should be looking at the Paris table and seeing, can I find this in the Paris table? 90% the answer will be no. You're going to have to slow by s somehow. But you still want to look just in case. You don't have to do any extra work. So look at the pairs table. You're going to look for this. You're not going to find anything. So here, we're going to apply a little trick. So we're going to say that this is equal to s plus 1 plus 4 minus 4 over s plus 5. So why did I do that? I'm seeing that the these terms here are the same. They go to the 1. There's no coefficients. So I'm trying to make it so that this, this is the same as the denominator. So we can cancel it out to one. So let me show what I mean. What I mean by that. So this becomes h of s equals s plus five minus four over s plus five, right? Because we add four and we minus four, the overall value doesn't change. Okay. So here we're going to break this up into s plus s, uh, s plus five over s plus five minus four over s plus five. Everyone follow me so far? Okay. So now we have h of s equals one minus four over s plus five. And please interrupt me if you have any questions. Okay, 
or going too fast or going too slow or anything. So now we're looking good. We look at the Pierce table, we see that there's something here. We feel pretty good. But now we have one kind of problem is we don't know which property to use. So we don't know where the region of convergence is, right? But we do know we just have to plot it. So once you get to this step, your first thing you should be doing is plotting. So you want to determine the poles. So we have a one here, there's no poles there. Yes, we have this term. So we have one pole at s equals minus five. How did I get minus five? I just set this equal to zero, right? So s plus five equals zero, s equals minus five. Okay. So now let's plot this. We have one pole at minus five. So we have two possible options for our region convergence. It can be to the right or to the left of this pole. It can never be on it, right? Right? It can never be on this. The region of convergence can never include a pole. So looking at this, we're given in the problem that it's a causal system. Okay. It's a causal system. So the definition of causality in this term is that it's to the right of the rightmost pole. So here in red is our region of convergence, ROC. And how did I know that? It's because we gave you in the problem it's a causal system. Okay. So now we are in a good shape. So we know the ROC. So now we're going to inverse Laplace it, looking at the Laplace table, inverse Laplace. So we know which property to use. The reason we did R try to find the ROC is because we need to know which property to use. So then we get our H of T equals delta T, which is the one, right? We have this one here, minus four. I'm bringing down the four here. And then I'm applying the property. So we're going to get four E to minus five T, U of T. Okay. Any questions, guys? Any questions? Okay, so there was a little bit of confusion earlier. So I, earlier when I was trying to explain the ROC is, um, I wanna give another example. So now we're looking at a different example, guys. This is not in the problem I gave you. This is gonna be an example to teach you guys about ROCs. So the, the Laplace table tells you the ROC. So it'll tell you the ROC for all the functions. And if you use the wrong ROC, it's not following you know the math. It doesn't make the, following the transformer doesn't really make any sense, right? So you have to use the right ROC. So let's imagine that there are two poles. Let's call this minus eight and plus seven, right? So there are three possibilities for the ROC. And once again, the reason, the reason we need to find the ROC is because we need to know which property to use. You're going to see two replicates of the same property and they're gonna have different ROCs. So if we tell you the system is causal, that means that your ROC will be to the right of the rightmost pole. And if we tell you that the system is anti-causal, it's going to be to the left of less leftmost pole. Okay. And if we tell you that it's stable, it's going to include the imaginary axis, right? So the reason I'm telling you this is that if he gives you information about what is anti-causal, what is or he tells you this is anti-causal, causal, or stable, he's giving you information about the ROC, and that's going to determine which Laplace property you use, right? If you use the wrong one, the question will be wrong. And what it gets tricky is, for example, in this stable equation where for this guy, ROC is to the right, which means you're going to use the, you know, RES is greater than minus alpha, but for this guy, ROC is to the left. Left. So you're going to use RE of S is less than minus alpha, right? So there's two different properties. Okay, any questions, guys? Yeah. What was the H of T you had written in the previous problem? Got you right here. Oh. So this delta T is from the one, and then the minus four is from the minus four over S plus five. Yeah. And what about the zero at negative one? Does that have anything to do with like the impulse response or the region of convergence? No, no, it doesn't have to do no. We don't need it like yeah, at all. It doesn't affect it. Basically, the reason of convergence is convergence is when something is, um, you know, you can like, it's when eventually it'll go to zero. If something converges, if something diverges, it'll go to infinity, right? So the 
point of the region of convergence is you're trying to find places in which it's not going to like blow up to infinity. So for example, that's why you plug in minus five here because you're dividing by zero, so it's going to like diverge. So no, no, it doesn't matter. Okay. At, le at least for this uh, for this purpose. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And that's actually the nice thing about the Laplace. So it's an extension of the Fourier transform. And the reason we even use it is because it works on functions that do diverge or they're like badly behaved or they're unstable. So yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So it is two. Uh, Y'all are welcome to go at any point if you're tired, need a break, whatever. We do have two more problems. We're going to do Z transform and we're going to do um, digital filter design. It is being recorded on Zoom. So if you're tired and need to go, that's all right. We're going to keep going and you can check the recording. Um, but yeah, just to let y'all know. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah. And yeah, it's thank you for coming. Cry. I'm, I'm going to actually cry. Thanks so much. Keep going. Uh, just, 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 no breaks. Yeah, finally. Uh, also, do you want to take a five minute break? Or do you want to just keep going? Five minute break. Five minute break. break. Yeah. All right, we'll okay. take a five minute break. We'll come back. And I think I'm going to use. Oh, no, I'm just, I think I'm doing online stuff still. Do you have a question, Ruby? Yes, I still have that. I'm um, just, it's not about you go to the mic to the last part. Yeah. Are you feeling part of the Okay. Assume that we have that one. And then this is saying three different cases of what it could be under the problem. So if it's defined to this causal, that means that you're, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that means that your region of convergence is going to be to the right of your right. And if it's defined as anti causal, it's to the left. Okay. So then the middle case is what these So if it says it's stable, that means it's going to be in whatever region includes the y hat. So in this particular case, you would have a zero. Yes. No, you can. I got it from Thailand. I bought it from Thailand. Thank you. Yeah. And it gets a little like tricky. I like it. It's baggy and it's comfortable. Thank you. I appreciate that. That just because. In this case, you would likely figure that not yeah, not to separate the central fraction. So you could go to some back and be aware that like now if the figure was first order to the right, and then just your back second set of fractions is gonna be the same. Is it confusing really? No, it does. It's not, but then it's like here. So when it was so wide, I think it's a lot going on. Y, 
the x is running along the y axis is actually the same as the other process. The y axis is actually three hours. But that's Dynamics, two classes I've never taken, but they I need concepts from them to do my projects. <laughs> I wonder how many like absolutes are gonna have to learn in entirely new skills set in this class. Like how many of these are gonna need to oh, yeah. just now? Yep. That's... I knew you learned the unity over winter break. Hell yeah, unity. Makes you feel better, ours is as much like all right. We wanna run it up. Here we go. Come up with some things. Or, no, three of us are biological, but I'm like I'm horrible at that stuff, like the cell stuff. I'm also like a signals guy. I'm I'm weird because I technically I'm biomedical track, so I'm on devices. But uh, because I was pre that, I've taken a bunch of the biological classes too, so I'm kind of in a weird spot. Right now. Like, oh, I think you're Wait, everyone, are you ready? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. My dad was just. Uh, Hi, everyone. He was just like discharged yesterday as well. You hear me, Zoom people? That's yeah, true. Give me a thumbs up, comment, say hi back to me. Hi, thank you, Ethan. Okay, I assume you hear me then. Okay, I think we're good to go. 
Okay, we are quite short on time, so let's spend five minutes doing this one. So for this question, we will be working on an inverse C transform and find the regions of convergence of the following function. All right, are we ready? Start in five minutes. We are super super short on time, so I will go ahead and start solving this now. We're gonna, we're gonna change plans. Yeah, the game has changed. All right, first thing first, let's try to find the ROC. And do you remember what do we need to find the ROC? We just need to find what is our pole, right? So we don't care about zero, we just care about the pole. So looking at this equation, um, audience in the room, what would be my pole here? What would make my denominator zero? What are my poles? Yes, yeah, one. One is the one thing. Negative one half. And yes, negative one half. All right. So we have our holes here, we're going to put them on a plane. And we have um, hole at one and negative one half. Let's say this is my scale. Okay, yeah. Negative. Let me check. Oh, yeah, it's inverse, right? Yeah, thank you. It should be two. Because it's C inverse. Because it's C inverse, it should be two, not one half. Thanks for that. So we have hold at one and negative two. And regions of convergence is gonna be outside of the outermost pole, right? R O C outside of the outermost pole. Therefore, the region of convergence in this case is going to be a circle. Let's say it looks like a circle. Uh, this shaded area outside of the circle. Okay. Just tricky thing is because it's the inverse, so it should be negative two, not one half. Okay. Thank you for correcting on that. All right, and that's for the ROC part. Now let's apply the inverse C transform for the function.
we do that, this term is going to be too chunky for us to find them on the table. Like, oh, what did you do? Oh my God. <laughs> um, I, I want to use the C transform pair and properties, but this is too complicated. Therefore, I need to simplify that down. And to do that, I'm going to do that by using partial fraction. So I would say this term is going to be a over 1 minus b to the power of negative 1. plus b over 1 plus 2 to the time c to the power of negative 1. And the next step is to find what is our a and b. I think you guys are familiar with solving partial fraction, but I, want, I would like to share you the trick that I used in my exam. It's kind of feel illegal to write it down in exam, so usually you just use that, use the trick for shaking. So what I'll do is that I'll um substitute a as like um c negative one that makes this term the whole term zero. Therefore, I'll substitute a with one. Oh, c negative one with one, and for this one. I'm going to substitute that with negative 1 over 2, right? OK. And for that, let's start with A. I will substitute um, this term in all of the term here. So I'll get my a equal 1 minus 1 over 3 times 1. And because um, and 1 minus 1, and this is going to be 0, I'm just going to ignore that. And another term will be 1 plus 2 times 1. And I'll get my a as two, three, over three. Then I'll get my A as two over nine. I'll do the same thing for B. Okay, I'll substitute C to the power of negative one by negative one over two. So, One minus one over two, one plus two times negative one over two. And this term is going to be zero, but we're just going to ignore that. So I'll get one plus one over six for numerator. Denominator, I'll get three over two, I think. So I'll get seven over six or three or two. Wow, that's long shock. Uh, so yeah. I'll get seven over nine for my B. And uh, let's do the shaking real quick. Like, if, if we do the traditional way, I advise you put the traditional way on your exam, but use this trick only just like when you are in rush and you really need to find what A and B is, or you just want to shake your answer, it would be helpful for that situation. But for 
the traditional way that you want to do um, will uh, multiply the denominator on the both sides of the equation. <laughs> Got a bit of writing here. I just rewrite my equation here. And multiply by denominator. And uh, not enough space here. Okay. Uh, you, okay. Let us say we understand what's happening here. And with that, we will get to solve partial fraction. And I would simplify the term. And I'll compare the term on the right hand side and the left hand side. And after the comparison, I'll get my um, A plus B equal one, right? And two A minus B equal one, negative one over three. Okay, let's solve for that. I'll add the two equations together. So I get my 3a equal uh, two over three. And therefore I get my a is two over nine. Ooh, it's just like the same answer as the trick I've done, right? Two over nine. Okay, that's good. Now let's check what our b is. Substitute a is 2 over 9 in one of the equations. I put that in equation 1. So 2 over 9 plus b equal 1. So I'll get my b as 7 over 9. Ooh. I get my a and b now. But if I use this trick, it's going to be much faster. But remember, one thing to remember about the trick that I used is that it only worked with first degree denominator. And yeah, just use that for shaking. So if I have to, if I get A and B now, I can write this function in partial fraction. And that is going to be A is 2 over 9 times 1 over 1 minus C to the power negative 1. And for B, 7 over 9. It's going to be 7 over 9 times 1 plus 2 times C to the power negative 1. 
All right. Now I am more comfortable to apply inversely transform with what I see now. I'm feeling good with that. So um, what I'm going to do is that for the next step, I'm going to look onto the table here. One. Would you like to try me solve what would be the inverse C transform for this term? Let's try this together. Okay. So for I, I would apply the linearity property of this, so I can just be 2 over 9 and 7 over 9b, but I still have to apply the inverse C transform for a thousand type of bracket. Okay. Something, something. And the inverse C transform of 1 over 1 minus C to the power of negative 1 can you help me find which number of the transform pair or table would that be? Two, thank you. So we'll have, um, let's do the first term. It's going to be um, two over nine multiply with um, un. Un, right? Beautiful. Now, what about the second term? Five. Thank you, beautiful. Um, I will have, what is alpha? Alpha is two. Two to the power of n. Yes, alpha is me and alpha is two. To the power of n multiplied by u n. And we add it together. Question? So those properties have the like, convergence like criteria on them and since the region of convergence given in the question is two is equal to two, which one do we choose? Because there's no equal option. So does it matter if you go like between five or six, it's greater than alpha, or is z greater than alpha or less than alpha? Currently it's equal to alpha. Okay, let me see. Our alpha in this case would just be two, right? Yeah, and the region of convergence is anything greater than two? Actually, it's not just anything greater than two. It's like um, outside the circle with radius of two. Yeah, so. Yeah, but it's not equal to two, right? Because it doesn't include that whole. I'm just saying, which one do we use? So it defines it. Yeah. Yeah, this is also kind of specifying in the question. Just to like error proof us, yeah. All right. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, I was just curious because if you like plug all the numbers in, it would be two is greater than two. Mm -hmm. Right, and so there's not an equal to option. So if we have that, should we always go with the greater than one because we're going outside? And then if it's inside, should we go with the less than one if it's yeah. on that board? I believe so, yes. I believe that's correct. Um, Here's the boundaries that are on the circle. Yeah, you don't use the values that are on the circle ever. Yeah. It's either less than or greater than. That is usually accounted for like anything because we know that it's going to be either a pole or a zero on the circle. So we never account for the values that are on the circle. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Okay. Oh, Jay. Uh, is the, the value of alpha, is it? Negative two or positive two because the root is one plus two. And then the transform table is minus alpha. So would that make it so it would make it 
negative to your right as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, it would be negative two. All right, and to wrap everything up, after we apply the inward C transform, we've already done this, so we would have two over nine of U N plus seven over nine of two to the power of N multiplied with U N. And that's the answer for this question. Oh. Which part? That's what I was just saying is like yeah. the alpha value would be negative two, so then it's parentheses negative two to the power of n. Wait, let me see, please. Because you have negative alpha. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. Nice catch, everyone. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, you have negative two. Yes. It's negative two. Yeah. So, yeah. Wait, hold on. I got like a little bit. Yeah, so it'd be negative two to the power of n. Okay. Yeah, so that is negative two to the power. Nice yeah. cash, nice cash, thank you. Yeah, I believe you're right, Jade. All right, and that's for this question. We have another problem. We have another problem. Let's see. Give them another. Do you have a question? We're going to let them do it and reach out to us oh, and just okay. introduce the problem. Here, what I can question watch. would you like to do? <laughs> okay, so we're going to give you all another Z transform problem. Um, so just write it down and give it a try on your own. And then we will, if you have any questions or want to verify an answer or anything, we'll send us an email or send us a Discord message just with any questions on that, just so we can get through this last bit. Okay, cool. And she's going to write down the problem for you right now. Longer time period, but is the professor just expecting us to do like a kind of like old gap like that we've been doing in the past? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Okay, so like, like, no, 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 so far. Okay, so this is the problem we have for y'all. 
So take a picture of it already. Um, give it a try on your own, um, and then reach out to one of the TAs over email or Discord at any point before the exam to ask any questions or verify your answer or anything like that. So. We are in book, guys. We have book for design left. The worst. Yes, the worst. Okay. Bye. So we are not solving any questions related to the computer design, but we're just going to go over the concept of computer design for C transforms. So we have We are usually given a signal of certain frequency starting from, frequency minimum, omega minimum, ranging to omega maximum. And if we want to isolate a certain frequency, let's call it frequency of increase. And yes, let's go ahead and try to isolate this frequency of interest. When I'm seeing isolate, I'm trying to have only this frequency in my plot and no other frequencies. So for this, we will have a semicircle or for circle ranging from zero high, zero being our frequency minimum and pi being our frequency maximum. And let's say that our median is here, our W, our frequency of interest. And when we are finding a filter, when we want to increase the presence of this specific signal, we are looking at obtaining the poles at the certain frequency. So we are going to choose a value that is very close to the value that is on the circle related to this specific frequency. And let's call this specific coordinate as P1 comma J times P2. So our or our, our transfer function at this specific coordinate is going to be Z minus P1 plus J times P2. N times. And this is our transfer function for that specific isolation point. So just remember when we want to obtain a peak of interest or highlight a peak of interest, we are looking at poles. And to obtain a pole, we are choosing a point that is very close to the circle and not on the circle, just very close to it. So we usually just multiply the point on the circle with this 
with 0 0.9 or like 0 0.09 to obtain the closest point to the circle. And when we are trying to eliminate a certain frequency, We, to eliminate this frequency, we just have to multiply the thing with a zero. So on the circle, we want zero to pi, and this is a maximum, and this is the point that we want to eliminate. And the coordinates for this point, let's see, 0, 1, and j times 0, 2. And the transfer function for this filter is going to be n times, or k times, z minus z1 plus j times z2. Yes, this is our real axis. This is our imaginary axis. And we'll see the poles and zeros and all these coordinates that we have. It's going to be very simple uh, multiples of pi. So do not worry about it. And even if you do not know the value, just try to make a guess. And yes, it should be good. Or if you don't know a certain value, you can just have your z1 and z2 in terms of cosine of the angle or the sine of the angle. That will also do. So this is so that will also do. Just just write something. <laughs> Yeah, your circle is a concept, as Brian said. Just do not panic. Does it like, matter whether you put the poles in terms of the entire house out of the circle? Yeah, so. Yeah. Oh, in terms of your transfer function? Yeah. Uh, I mean, not really, but it'll affect how, I mean, it'll change the transfer function, but you'll still have the same form. Yeah. Um, but it'll affect the stability of the system. Uh, so usually they give you the circle. It's not usually just one. It's kind of like the gain circle or the gain factor that's given. And usually when the values are inside the system, it's converging and the system is stable. And everything, all the system's properties come into uh, account inside the circle. And when it's outside, it may not be as stable. It could be unstable or it could be non causal or anything. The system could not be an empty high either when it's outside the circle. So we usually look for points that are inside the circle. Because yeah. I remember you talked to mention about how, like, um, the out, like, the region of convergence has to be like the outermost. So, like, there's other mm -hmm. poles that are outside that, like, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> but in this uh, scenario, when we're talking about poles, it's just the z minus p factor that is in the denominator of the transfer function. And the poles that we're talking about is the, yeah, the z values that are like on the numerator of the transfer function. Are zeros and the one that we have numbers. Just to look back at the recitation for a moment. And again, homophy has a problem solving. Yes, we also discussed it in the recitation. Unfortunately, there's no recitation regarding that. So, no, yes. I didn't do this, so I'll make one. So we are just going to post the solution but a little later because it's the same question that is also on the homework. 
but uh, just watch out for Tuesday. Good one for you. So that's it. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't realize that. Hi. Can I can you ask a question about the hyper? Oh, for this problem, I know it was similar to the Jesus. Jesus. 